gave a speech about bashing the shell and advanced script. So please enjoy. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, I must admit, this is not my usual haunt. Um, for those who don't know me, know me I'm Martin Keeley. Uh, I've been hanging around Linux and Auckland for ages. Uh, unless you're already a shell guru, this session will hopefully clarify your understanding of the shell. If you are a shell guru, I'd appreciate your interjections. Uh, I'd hope you feel more confident making changes to existing scripts to make your own scripts from that that work faster and more efficiently and to understand some of the history of the shell and why it seems so contorted in places as indeed it can be. Volume tick? Want to check? How's that for people? Have I lost my... How do we sound now? Yeah, let's max it out. Okay, how's this? I started programming at the age of nine when a friend of my parents brought his computer to our family batch and found myself modifying a program he brought along in BASIC. A decade later, I encountered the Unix command line shell at university when, as a stage two student, I wangled the use of a stage three student's defunct account because he'd quit. And, uh, since that was, um, well, should we say, uh, outside the scope of my studies, um, I didn't use it that much, but the following year I was in stage three and got to use the shell a fair bit. However, at that stage, I also encountered the sea, sh the sea shell, uh, which I refer to as the dark side. It, uh, it took me a couple of years to realize that, in fact, the born shell and its derivatives were actually a superior programming tool. You're here to learn about BASH, which is an acronym for the Born Again Shell, after Stephen Bourne, who was the author of the Born Shell. And for the last 20 odd years, it's, the BASH has been maintained by Chet Ramey. I guess I should start. How is everybody's experience in the shell? Does anybody kind of want a recap of what a shell is? You all confident on that? Good, we're in the right place. The big thing that made the Unix shell different from its predecessors at the time was that it combined both a command line and a scripting language. That sounds obvious today, but even in 1995, DOS's command.com had subtly different syntax for scripts or on the command line to do with variable expansion. Over the last 40 years, there have been dozens of shells. Most of them well and truly defunct by now. And the re resilience of Bash is due in no small part to it being one of the original GNU project things. Uh, that's to say, it was Bash, GCC, and Herd. Well, two out of three is not bad. Many parts of the shell owe their heritage not to regular programming languages, but to the sort of job control languages and text processing languages. So, for example, when it comes to using a variable, when you want to use the variable, you put a dollar sign in front. When you want to change its value, 
you don't put it on the sign in front. Moreover, spaces are not allowed. Now, you, you guys are probably mostly aware of that sort of thing. That's, it's the sort of thing though, that strikes people as strange, odd. Why is it like that? And this is because it comes from the environment of text processing languages, macro languages, that sort of thing. It's also worth reminding people that the shell is not a terminal. The terminal window, as we typically have today, is a separate program entirely. Now, again, most of you are probably aware of that. Anybody kind of want a, a recap on the distinction? Okay. I somewhat flippantly put on here my favorite shell is Perl dash D. Well, strictly I do use bash as my favorite shell, but it's my second port of call. And part of this talk is about really when the limits of the shell are reached and where you should move to another tool, or perhaps even start with another tool. So, the question then is, how does the shell actually work? Well, the shell reads commands and executes them. It seems kind of obvious. You get a line of text, the first word is a command, the remaining words are arguments for it. There's a whole bunch of stuff which goes in. There's the command line arguments, the file descriptors, the standard in, standard output. Use things like your current directory, your environment. Identities. Now, started out with just user and group ID back in the day. It's kind of grown a little bit these days. Actually, can I get the sound check? I'm getting a bit of, a bit of whistle on this. Is everybody getting that little whistle on the sound? Yeah, could we just, just back it down a bit? We don't down. Can you, can you still hear me? Okay. Okay, so I'll try and speak up. It's when I actually talking, it's still feedback? No. Try that. Okay. The magic sweet spot. <laughs> The shell predates command, uh, the use of shared li libraries on Unix systems. As a result, a lot of decisions were made early on. Things like the file descriptors are done in the shell before the program ever starts. Your redirections, your variable expansions, your wildcard expansions. Now, you, we can argue about wildcard expansions, but historically, those other aspects have proven to be quite useful and fairly sound. Most of the commands, of course, you type are external binaries. Uh, but really, the interesting part of the shell comes with the built ins and the compound commands. Okay, so. Sorry, I'm missing a slide here. I'm going to have to come back to that. A simple command is simply a command that looks like an external command that starts with a command word and has arguments. But some, of course, are actually built-ins. You change your CD and read commands being classics. They have to be a built-in because they affect the shell context, as indeed ULimit and a bunch of others that pertain to the previous slide. The parsing process people often find a bit arcane. How do you get from wanting to achieve something, say, replacing some stuff in a file, to actually having a piece of code that works. So, by way of example, here's a task. Replace every triple slash with 
some as yet to be defined value. Well, let's throw the value in a variable. So the search passion is that. But to make a regular expression out of that, let's say we're going to put it in said, you need to double all the backslashes. That's because said's own syntax says backslash is a special character, so you need a backslash in front of it. So each one gets backslash. But then it gets a little more interesting because the shell also has a rule that says backslash is a special. So you get this rather long thing like this. And so, of course, then you have your whole command looking a little bit like this. And some of you probably blink at that and go, what are these doing here? Well, the point is it doesn't actually matter. You can put them wherever because they're actually parsed earlier. So all of the redirections are done and then you have your command line. So am I boring everybody with all the background or is it informing people? The other thing, of course, is that not all commands are actually the, the simple ones. Because if you just have simple commands, you're just going to run through and you get to getting the, yeah, one, one step after another. It's pretty boring. You're not really going to achieve very much. So th then it's a matter of, OK, so what's something a little more interesting? Uh, and then you come to your compound commands. Scale this to so okay. I edited the wrong slide. <laughs> Most of this talk I intend to do as interactive. So if you have questions, ideas, examples, I appreciate you speaking up with the microphone here. I'd like to prep the guys to run around with the mic because it's likely to be needed. I'd also like to look at the wiki page for this talk. Um, if you have something more than a one-liner, could we actually perhaps even log in and edit this while we're live here? Does that sound feasible for people? Just add your ideas, particularly if you want to upload, put a file with a sort of 10-line script or something of that nature. Is that doable for people? I'm not seeing a lot of nods. Okay, I'll just try. Sorry, the, sorry. the joys of having a joys of having a beard. The, it, 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 um, if I hold, if I hold this out in front, that might help. How's that? Okay. Now. This is intended as an interactive session, so does anybody not have a, like a laptop with them or a neighbour sitting next to them with a laptop? You might be a good time if you're in that position to do a little seat, seating rearrangement. I'm going to suggest that for the sake of being able to make this work, we'll also look at IRC for one-liners if people want to use that. Of course it helps if I'm actually connected. So. 
It's important, just as part of background while we're getting sorted, the shell structure has while loops, if statements, for loops, etc. Those can be arbitrarily nested. You have functions, you have pretty much all the stuff you expect in a usual programming language. Variable scoping is a bit weird, but we cope. Now, aliases were an add -on, a late add-on. They are one of those things that people think might have actually been a precursor function. That's not actually the case. They were an add-on for compatibility, mainly with C shell in some ways. except that's heavier. <laughs> okay. You don't have one of those either? Um, oh, okay. You can check the microphone onto here. <laughs> we'll give that a shot, shall we? How's that? Yeah. Looks a bit strange, but kind of works out. <laughs> Actually, I want to start with is a script I have here, which is the one that I use to drive the monitor here. And you probably need that a little bit bigger font. Big enough for people? No, keep going. Okay, sorry, that's about as big as it gets. And it's pr trimming. Okay. Um, th this is kind of a typical. The key piece in amongst all of this is down the little way, where we're looking at the XR and R command, which basically is doing a report on everything that's connected as a display. Looks like that. So you've got a display name. So, and some details, and then a bunch of resolutions that it supports. So essentially, this is a use right. So this is a loop, right, from here down to here, reading line at a time. This odd-looking construct here says, I want to take a line. I want it raw. I want no white space stripping. IFS is a special variable that tell, dictates how white space stripping is handled. Anyone knows that? Anyone who want that further explained? OK. The read command is a built-in. It takes a variable and takes from standard input and assigns values. Its default behavior is to interpret backslashes to flush off white space, that sort of thing. And the white space splitting is controlled by I, the IFS variable. So this is actually saying IFS is empty. That space there is a separator after the assignment. It's not part of the assignment. Backslash there says we're going on to the next line. How comfortable are people with this as a level of complexity for a script. 
this is the sort of thing. Hands up those who would write this for themselves. Okay. Hands up who feel completely out of their depth looking at it. Okay. And who then would like to know what it does? <laughs> I'm glad there are more in the last group. Um, bear, the rest of you should bear with us for a little while. Essentially, it's doing match all the contents of the line. So this is just a usual shell wildcard pattern. So you've got the, ast the asterisk indicating match anything. So the line that starts with screen, it had a little bit of information. It had the maximum and width and height embedded in it preceded by the word maximum. So you've got the line that we read there. This is an assignment. In the assignment is a variable expansion. Take the line. That means strip off a prefix. The prefix being everything up to the first occurrence of the word maximum. We then redo the assignment. And in this case, it is remove all space characters. We should then be left with some digits and an X. Right about here. Right. We then you. Yep. I'm just wondering, uh, with the replacement notation, um, is it like said in that you can use any character you want, or does it have to be a slash? That does have to be slash there, yeah. And the double slash means all of them. And nothing in there means. Is the mouse visible? It's kind of. The mouse doesn't get any bigger when I make the font bigger. <laughs> um, the X here now is the field separator. So it will read two values separated by an X. So you get the width and the height. If you get a screen line without, that doesn't have a maximum line, don't bother. The lines that start with a white space, remember, back here, are available resolutions. Now, it's worth noting that the plus sign here means this is the preferred resolution. So we get a current display number. It's a little cryptic in the naming. We have a line as an array. Now, we'll come back to that, but it basically means it splits it on the white space by default. That's the default IFS value. So you get the essentially some white space here, which will be ignored. A word, some white space, another word. And in this case, all we want is the first word. And we do a bit of validation, make sure it's not stupid. And then we say, OK, for the current display number, it has these modes. So mnum is a variable. The, the dollar sign denoting variable, you all know that's right. So, <laughs> so you have a display number, and within the display number, you have a mode number. This S array is a associative array, which means it takes a string as its value. This is kind of a way of butchering things to give yourself more complex data structures. Ordinarily, you get flat arrays, and that's that. This is a technique by which you can actually have arrays that are and other structures are a little more complicated. The double bracket here, finishing here, is the indication of the arithmetic context. So we have three three assignments that are occurring within arithmetic context. You get pretty much all the operators from, that are provided by the C language. So you have bitwise operators, shift, left shift, right shift, arithmetic operators, assignment operators. Ternary operator, if you fancy that one. Essentially, we're building up a data structure that describes the available devices. Each time you get a line that says connected, that's the start of a new display. So we record the display's name, because we're going to need that to drive it later. Or if it says disconnected, I connect without a space in front of it. Then it's another display, but we're going to ignore it. After, before we did that, up here, so a couple of declarations, right? So this, this is the declare the S 
variable as an associative array, so declared ash capital A. Uh, we're getting into sort of territory that people are familiar with, would like to know more about. Okay. Has anybody, while you're sitting there, yet come up with any interesting curly questions to fire away? Okay. That's a very good point. Okay. The when you have a variable assignment that precedes a command in the same line, log, same logical link, if it's backslash, it counts the same line, right? Then that's only for the scope of that single command. So. So that's only for that read command, and that's a, a effectively whatever value IFS has before that will be restored immediately following that command. It's in the case of an external card, it's actually injected into the environment that it's, pro, it's provided. Um, in the case of a built-in, it just behaves as a, a temporary. So that makes sense. Sorry, just to be first yes. No, it's not. You see the backslash on the end of the line? Yes. That means this is one logical line. It's folded up before anything else happens. So it's one command that includes IFS and the read together. Okay, that, that does help. What's a card one? I'll repeat. Just coming from sort of a Java background. Yep. Um, there, are, there is a sort of bash debugger that some folk use, but the simplest is usually just run a bash with the debug option. Sorry? You can, yes. yes. Um, Sorry, could you explain that command? Um, okay, when you launch a script, the very first thing is this line here. So anybody would need an explanation? Yeah, all right. The hash bang at the beginning is a trigger to the kernel. So when the, you say execute a command, the kernel sees those 16 bits and goes, oh, it's actually a script, and the remainder of the line starts with the, the command interpreter. So running that is basically identical to running that after the kernel has inserted the path, the shell's done a search path and so on. But the X then says turn on debugging right from the start. Um, I get sort of a little bit antsy about that sort of thing. So, Sorry, the, the, the question wasn't answered. How do you actually debug it? How do you debug? Through it? So I don't okay, there isn't really a single step thing as such. Um, but Typically, scripts are short enough that you just, they're one shot sort of things anyway. This is a little on the long side for your typical so, script. Is there a utility for understanding assignments, variable values, and stuff like this as I run? Because I don't understand this, but I typically run it through a debugger on code that I, I, I right. and try and understand the call, the stack, what was going on around me to understand the code. Is there a way there to isn't. There is not a call stack in the, in, in the sense that you're used to having separate variables at each function and so on. Uh, effectively, all variables are global in scope but can be temporarily overridden. And when you do that, well, some functions also require that, but also because things are external programs, they get copies of everything anyway. So the effect of that is negligible in, in most cases. Um, what you're seeing here is the output as it executes each command within the script. So the plus sign at the beginning just, just denotes that this is happening. So you see the variable assignments as they occur. You see the case statement. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you which case line matched. It just shows you the command that occurred within the matching case. So it's not ideal, but it is a start. Um, being a script, you can simply instrument it 
with output whenever you need to. There's no, it's not a big hassle to do that. This is quite long because it's going around that big fat loop for all of the couple of dozen lines in the script. Excuse me. Could you at some stage, not necessarily now, um, explain your stylistic reasons or um, technical for variable declaration, like when you use declare, when you use local, and then stylistically when you use capital letters and when you use small letters? Okay. Um, Please. I might as well address that now. It, stylistically, yeah, I, I tend to a minimalist sort of style, so those array declarations are necessary because otherwise you don't get the associative behaviour. It translates everything into numeric context and then tries to evaluate it. And of course those item uh, the, the, these items here are not valid numeric expressions. So you, you just immediately get an error and it won't work. Um, Local is necessary for your scoping rules, so that it actually works. Um, generally, it's a good idea to make anything local, unless you want it not to be local, as in you actually want to affect the external variables outside the function. Um, as for variable names, upper and lowercase, there's a trend these days towards using lowercase for anything that's not a, an environment variable. Now, an environment variable simply means that it is included in the environment that is given to any external programs. Any subshells will get all of the variables, but the external programs only get those things which are explicitly exported, so hence the export command. For example, the term here, terminal, right? Amazing how much junk you wind up with in here when when the um, operating system decides it knows what you need. <laughs> Whereas all of the variables and uh, okay, uh, there are rather more, um, yeah, as well as the shell functions. Uh, would, actually, would you want to like me to go into the shell? Good question. Just back on debugging, when you find you need a step through debugger, that might be an indication that this shell script's getting too long. Um, shell script's too long, or even that you're using the wrong tool. You could consider Bash or Perl, or, the other thing or, Perl if you, or, or Python. Or, or if you Google, there are a couple of ways of getting step through, sort yes, of, but yeah. they're better for learning than actually using. <laughs> but there are facilities in the shell, very rudimentary facilities in the shell for doing single step type operations where you can essentially emulate the SIGIO trap that CPUs do where it'll give a, a pseudo signal um, after, each, after each line but it is quite cumbersome to write anything that can use it. Um, do go and have a look at that. I'll put something on the LCA wiki page about that after the talk. Um, but yeah, de debugging, if you get to the stage where debugging is a serious issue and just inserting extra print statements or echo statements isn't enough, then yeah, you're probably getting to the realm of maybe another tool would be in order. Um, right. You can ignore that block. I'm basically just printing out so I can see what's happened. I'm going pick the first display and make sure it's actually the display for the because the rest of the script's not going to work. Um, I define a couple of functions. One of the things you can do is actually rotate a display render. That's just a feature of it. Um, so there's a little bit of arithmetic here that goes, well, yeah, you need to transpose the width and height if you're going to rotate it. Um, then I have some preferred default setups. Um, this one's one I'm using at the moment. Sorry. This one. Which essentially just goes this display and that display 
is over here. So you can imagine I, I'm just a little, little confused sometimes. If there's something supplied on the command line, so this is iterating, so loops, starts here, goes for a little way, down to here, all right? Just slightly over a screen, all sorry. Yep. Um, some of the problems we've had with shell scripts is in um, trying to make the portable across Red Hat, Fedora, Australia's versus Debian Australia's. And yep. running them as root in something cross. Okay. All right. Qu questions around portability of script between different Linux distributions. Yeah, so some of the things we've had to um, try and develop, I guess, guidelines or stylistic conventions around what are the existing environment variables um, and running scripts in cron on some sort of predefined schedule in or as a different user account. All right. And so um, some of those things you were talking about before. I, I, sh I showed you earlier that, that list with the, yeah. the great long list of variables that the environment had set just because I hadn't logged into an Ubuntu desktop, right? Yeah. Uh, when you run a job from cron, almost all of those are absent. So, uh, yes, you, you encounter problems and you start relying on things and they're just not there and you kind of assu you assume that the cron is going to run in the same kind of context as your login shell and it doesn't and that's frustrating. Um, it can be useful just to throw in a cron job that runs in one minute's time, just does env and then exits and then you'll get a mail message with what's actually there. Uh, and you can go from there and see what you need to add. Do you have any sort of um, conventions or guidelines for declaratively specifying your dependency on what well, things like given set of environment variables the, should be? The, the dependencies, um, it's a good idea, for example, to set path at the top of a script if it's going to be installed for multiple users because you don't want to start picking up some random command that looks like ls but isn't quite out of the user's home bin or something like that nature. Uh, you may also need a private bin for the particular project you're, you're running on. It's a hassle to have to keep doing full paths for every command. So uh, having full paths for every command is actually a detriment because it means you can't run two versions, one for test and one for live, because it'll always use the wrong set of subcommands. So. I mean, so for instance, in, in Ubuntu, which is what we're using in our production environment at the moment, there's a wide and varied number of techniques for setting environment variables, ranging from etc environment through to etc profile, through to dot bash rc. Uh, okay, the startup, startup scripts for a shell, that's a, probably something worth looking at. Here are some of them. <laughs> Now, and that's the classic one for any POSIX shell. There, that's my local profile. On top of that, you have a bunch in here as well. Um, you'll notice the directory.d. Um, that's quite common where you actually have different files supplied from different packages. It's much cleaner to have a, a whole file for a package and just throw it in a common directory. And somewhere else, there'll be something which will actually read that. So okay. that's a very short version. All right. OK, so these are. So they start with a bunch of, go to the back of the top, checking whether you want the dash V flag for verbose, because they wind up turning them, I think they turn them off. I haven't actually read this before, so I'm kind of doing this on the fly. <laughs> but the, down near the bottom, somewhere, there'll be a loop. Yeah. Oh my goodness, don't look at that. <laughs> um, output from the ls command, almost all the guidelines now say don't, don't do that. Um, that's, 
this is the ls command embedded in the middle of that and finding everything in that directory and it says command so that it's only the binary version of ls you're not picking up some alias or anything like that um, LC all is an environment setting that says we want the collation order for ls to come out straight ascii and then that block with bracketing says take all of that and just plonk it in as if it had been typed into that line all right so it's iterating over the thing in the directory and here it reads it having made sure that it's um, well not one of the various things you want to avoid um, typically you don't want to read editor backups of your config files you want to actually read the main ones yeah uh, for loops splitting on, uh, yes, that's on. Well, any time you do a variable expansion, that will be on IFS. Oh, okay. Yeah. Assuming you haven't put double quotes around it. Now, that's kind of critical, right? There's the necessity for double quotes. That said example I gave earlier, the word double quotes, I should have explained. If you put single quotes, you don't get the variable expanded. If you put double quotes, you get variables, but you need to put extra backslashes. So, the problem is LS output is not portable. This works because it's part of Debian, that's part of Ubuntu's supplied set, and they supply the version of LS that works. So, but you were just kind of not, not look too closely at that. Okay. Where do we get up to? Mirroring, um, so this loop, as I say, this argument handling. So you get a bunch of arguments, dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, etc. Uh, dollar hash tells you how many arguments you have. So if you put that in numeric context, it tells you whether there's more than zero. Um, then basically going, well, what I did here is decided I just wanted to chop off any hyphens on the beginning of any, any options. Um, that's kind of cheating, but it means I can go naught or dash naught and it would match that one. I can make more explicit changes, like in this by which monitor I want as my primary. And down here I can go verbose And then I work on the variables that I've set. So if I ha I'm still using the defaults, I will have a look at what devices are attached. So if it's a DBI output that's 16 by 1200, then I know that's my home monitor, unless I say otherwise. And it sits there instead of there. <laughs> and then I build up a command string. So we get this xrnr args start with we need how it needs a frame buffer size so do sorry and then for each of the displays that we're going to use we add that display and we might turn it off we might say it's preferred and we give it a position relative so it's wherever right Um, this was a little bit experimental. Um, if I put v, this means that I'm defining a function. Functions are defined when the definition of the function runs as a command, right? So the script comes down here, gets to if. Now, I'm kind of cheating. Dry run is a variable, but I only give it the values true or false. So I can just go if variable, and it works. If it's true, then we define the function that way. Otherwise, we define the, function, the same name of function a different way. So you'll only get one of these function definitions. And then we go do that. And because all it does is simply invokes the command that is its given arguments there, or it prints them, or it just prints them and doesn't execute them. And then we're done. So is that it? 
a useful example of a bunch of techniques in the shell that people... Okay? Would you like me to try something bigger or smaller next? Excuse me, the end's a bit loose. Okay, try something really small. This is one that's quite ancient, so I've used the let command rather than the double brackets for arithmetic context. They are entirely equivalent except for the quoting rules. I.e., if you use let, you have to quote it because it looks like an ordinary command if you use the round brackets. They're a syntactic element and you don't need the quotes. The idea of this command is simply that it will push a bunch of lines that match the width of your terminal. Okay? So we get the STTY size, which just outputs two numbers, rows, columns, right? So we wrap that up in an output capture. We then go set. So that's equivalent to set. Right? The dash dash here is common in all shell commands, pretty much all commands. It just means we don't have any arguments. Everything after this is not a switch. It's an actual, sorry, not, we do have arguments, we don't have options. Then we just go output the second one there and assign it to that variable. And then we go and make something that's long enough. We just keep making it, double it until it's big enough. Right? And then we spit it out. That makes sense? Nice and simple, straightforward. Anyone want explanations in more detail? Okay. are relatively straightforward. You're just looking for a short task to occur. Uh, but often, sometimes, yes, you need something. Uh, generally, you would write a script and put everything in it because the interaction with the command line for cron is actually quite complex. Dash x, the bash dash x output puts more pluses as the the hierarchy is encountered. Sorry, the question the question here is about cron and the, um, well, and, the and the second question was around the hierarchy of inclusions. Um, the dot command is you know, dot and file name means read the file as part of the current shell. Those who are contemplating leaving, what would you like to see instead? I'd like to make this worth people's while. So, does any have anyone have more open questions on the shell? I can cover the history of the shell, why it's different. Okay, question. 
Yeah, um, I still get hung up on the environment. I set a variable, a path for root, but yes. when I sudo, it's not there. When you sudo? Yeah. Sudo so. quite explicitly um, sanitizes the environment. That's uh, something it does as a security measure. So, yes, you need to reset it after sudo. Um, if it's something you want to do commonly enough, you could make a short script and, and put the settings in that and then read that from the shell that, that you've Could got you Could you write an example? I won't okay. catch it unless I see it. Um, right. It's gone. Ah. Right. Uh, hmm. Nearly right the first time. I have two sudos, um, one that doesn't sanitize. <laughs> right, not there. Um, so what we, what I'm talking about here is basically, you know, Typically, you're going sudo and some command, which happens to be a shell script. Uh, you can control what sudo will run, which allows a user to run in that respect. You, it's better than an open thing. Um, it also, sudo also means you're not sharing around the root password between all the different people who are supposed to have root access. So there are pros and cons. I'm generally in favor of sudo over the alternative of SU, although it's not quite as portable, unfortunately, but all Linux distributions, as far as I know, have it. To come back to your question. Um, That's kind of the idea. Does that make sense? So if you have a script that... What sort of settings do you need inside your script that you're running under sudo? Because the other option is simply to set them as part of the command line. Yeah. Okay. That is, that should pretty much cover it. That means we're explicitly copying the path into the command that's being run under sudo. Does that make sense? Uh, obviously. Excuse me, Martin. Um, yeah. As we're talking about sudoers, um, within sudoers, um, we have command. Can I talk about sudoers? I just want to. Uh, it seems reasonably in scope. Okay. For um, we want to restrict um, uh, the command set that can be incorporated with sudoers. So, say we've got something like um, a command alias says to a particular um, granular group say slash op product name bin and then they can execute all the commands within that. Typically what's used is opt product name bin then slash star but however that's that product name group can sudo and execute more than just under bin. Do you know what I mean? Um, they can go dot dot 
up a directory, execute other commands, so this other commands. You're talking here sub commands of the ones that you as the user invoke. Yes, we're trying to restrict them to use the commands within the directory, but not use the wildcard because the wildcard can be exploited to issue other commands outside the sub directory of their domain. If that makes sense. My understanding is that the dot dot is. Exp implicitly excluded, but I will have to check that. Would you like to come back to me after the yeah, session? Yeah, sure. It might be just to do with um, this sudoers notation with the level of sudoers that are, you know, like in some OSs, uh, that flag may not be incorporated for sudoers, yeah, if that makes just, sense. Just, just generally, this is a question of whether the star wildcard will match dot and dot dot. Uh, pro programs like sudo and other security sensitive programs will tend to take a position of excluding any attempt to go up a directory level because that would otherwise enable you to thwart the access controls that are required. And to avoid using commands they shouldn't be using yeah, yes. you know, as well. Yes. Thank you. Um, as you can see this is a particularly simple and straightforward one that just says I can do anything. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in the sudo command where you put path equals rolls path, uh, okay. just a few lines up, yeah. uh, does sudo walk through all of the arguments to find something with equals and set up the environment, or does it just pass all of the arguments to the, some sort of default shell and have the default shell do all that stuff? We can find out. Okay, so you see here, it's included a copy of the shell, so that's how it gets there. Yeah, sure. Um, in a sense, it doesn't actually matter whether it's sudo that does it or it asks somebody else to do it, because the net effect is yes, it will walk through yeah. and do the prefix assignments as is normal, okay. and put them into the environment for the command that's specified. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Any other sort of random questions people like addressed? Okay. <laughs> What's your personal preferred reference guide or book that you go to for Bash? Um, Greg Woolwich's wiki page. Greg, uh, Greg Woolwich runs a wiki page that has. Um, I'm, I'll put it. Yeah, um, I, yes. no, I, have, I don't have it there. I'm sorry. Um, I will have to forward that afterwards. Um, I'll, I will be putting links on, on here um, under the further reading section. Yep. Just getting back to the path variable and cron jobs. Um, typically, root has its own. Um, dot profile. Why is that not um, executed and all of the path stuff in that um, run when it when root is running a cron job? Okay, cron jobs run as non-interactive. They don't have a controlling terminal. Then, in fact, no input or output at all. Um, well, output is allowed. It goes into a mail message if it's not empty. The use of the dot profile or dot bash profile um, it only applies to login shells, which are usually but not always a subset of interactive shells. To have an interactive shell, you need a controlling terminal, either a, a real physical terminal, like on a serial line, for those of you old enough to remember those, uh, or a terminal window, as, as you expect. Uh, bash runs in one of three modes. It has a login shell, an interactive shell that's not a login shell, or a non-interactive shell. Um, actually, that's a point. There's a little. I mentioned aliases earlier, which I'll, so I'll come back to that. Um, essentially, because it's a non-interactive shell, it doesn't get any of the startup files read by default. You would have to explicitly include, include those dot dollar home slash dot profile or whatever you thought was necessary. Uh, I recommend in that case you put like a dot bash cron or something like that, so to make it clear that this is for use for your on jobs and not for your other general use, unless you're sure, sure that you want everything. Um, 
you might even find it useful to have a, a file which is the common parts that apply to cron and to your login shell and read that from both of them. So. Thank you. Perhaps if nobody has an immediate question, am I? Okay, up the back there. Not, not so much of a, a question, but just more as a comment. Um, if you do have situations where you've got crons, and whenever that, that you want to script in that cron job to run up with a certain environment variable, you can specify in cron an environment variable for it to include in scripts that it runs. Uh, Vixie, so, Vixie cron, yes, you can yeah. specify environment variables that are effectively global to that cron tab. Yeah, so what we've done in situations where we've had maybe software installed in different directories on different machines, is th there'll be a cron for that program, a cron for, you, for that user. And as part of that cron tab, the first thing it does is it sets the environment variable for that machine in, yes. in the correct location. So that, they, that way it's the same cron scripts running on all the machines, but they're picking up the environment variable directly from cron, which can be quite useful. Okay, not on that. No, no examples, sorry. <laughs> but yes, the idea is that, that in amongst the various parts, everyone know about cron? Anyone want to learn about cron? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as well as the pattern match for the date, you can simply put an assign a variable assignment that is public. In that said example I gave earlier, there was kind of the, the doubling up of the quotes, right? The backslashes. You have the quotes and the backslashes, and it, it, that's not as bad as it gets. If you run, for example, SSH and run a remote command, the shell gets to interpret the SSH, local SSH command and the arguments, so the backslashes get stripped out once, and it feeds it to a shell at the remote end, which does the same. So all of a sudden, when you want to SSH to another host and replace it, those three backslashes, you go from 12 to 24 backslashes. I don't have it written up, but you get the picture. Essentially, essentially, every time a shell reads a command, it's redoing the quote processing, the backslash processing. So, any other random questions at the moment? Or we go and have an early lunch? Yep. The system that I deal with has shell scripts that run under Red Hat Linux and therefore bash. Yes. But the same system is designed to run under AIX. And I'm told by the suppliers that corn shell is the only shell that is common between those two operating systems. And that corn and bash deal with some variables differently. So they want their scripts to run under corn shell. Have any comment? Yeah, the, the differences are around the syntax for array variables. Uh, the bash notation, as I showed in that, has name equals brackets and a list of values. You wonder, um, the corn shell has a different syntax for setting a composite variable. Um, if you're not using arrays, then yeah, you're pretty much clear. Uh, there are some very subtle differences around declaration statements, but you're unlikely to find they make any difference in practice. Ah, built-in echo, yes. Echo is found everywhere and behaves differently everywhere. So the recommended practice these days is, if you can, to use the POSIX printf command instead. Um, uh, perhaps I, I'll just deal with echo and printf for a moment. Um, can you Oh, you said quick um, stop early for lunch, but can you run us through like, one of your most killer scripts? <laughs> Even more complex? Um, let's see. Uh, I'll just finish with Echo for a minute. Um, as it stands, you've got this sort of thing. Right? If, on the other hand, 
we go to So that's that's the sort of difference you'd be observing your AIX echo command. Um, right. So even bash echo can do two different things. The as I say, the recommendation is that you would put format string and then now actually those quotes aren't needed. They don't don't achieve anything at all, right? So it's, it's a lot more flexible, it has more options, and it behaves consistently everywhere that it's available. Uh, it's not universally available on older systems, but uh, I think POSIX 2004 requires it, so it's on almost everything. On this one? Yes, that's what you Anybody need that explained? Okay. <laughs> so, just a question regarding um, uh, case. Um, I've used case before, um, but I find it frustrating that it doesn't support number ranges. It supports wildcard matching of, say, one one star would be one hundred, and also ten, and also eleven, but it wouldn't match two, um, so you couldn't to, to like to do. A, it, it's, it's very difficult to do ranges um, with precision. Uh, what would you recommend as an alternative? There's that sort of thing. Yeah. Let's do that again. Matches a character at a time. I was being a little flippant. So you've got either a single digit or two digits. Uh, so the, constructing a range that will match, say, 37 through 92 is a little more complicated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's why I was saying, is there a neat uh, way of doing that rather than the cumbersome? Um, I'd more go for, well, let's say A equals 14, right? So I'd more go for A is greater than 10. Is less than 93, right? Then. Right. So, if you're just wanting a numeric range, that's probably the simplest way to do it. Okay, thanks. Just refresh the wiki page and check if I put the right link to this Greg Woolage's thing because I've never heard of it before, but I kind of found it and edited it. And also, please take the Relying on Wi Fi still. This, so. <laughs> Quit the Wi Fi. Everything manually, but, so network interfaces. Resolver. Again, this is a case of parsing the input from something which is the output from said on roll files. This is basically dissecting DHCP lease files. It's really, I should have done this in Perl or something else, right? But it was just a quick hack together in shell. In shell. So again, it's a, a loop 
up here that does yeah, read a timestamp and lease. And then when I find a lease, split that into an array because you get a whole bunch of leases. Um, what all this does is takes the lease file and reformat it so it's one lease per line, which then makes it easier for the shell to handle. The shell has a very kind of line at a time approach. But uh, back to your question. Yay, we're up. Oh, good. You found the village. Appreciate that. Uh, my question. Uh, could you go through some cases where um, you can use um, regects? So, like, I noticed you were using it in cases and a few other places. I'm, I'm, sometimes when I do my bash environment trying to do a, a regex, I, I, I usually do it in some weird way or haven't got spaces right or something like okay. that. The, there are two pattern matching methods available in bash. The, the classic shell wildcard where question mark matches one character and star matches any number of characters. The regex matching is a little more complicated. Are you all familiar with regex building? Yeah. So you need a dot to match any character and then star or question mark. Uh, um, there is a third option in batch which is the extended wildcards where you can have bracketed groups and things like that. But really the only useful command that uses regex matching is the double square bracket, so some variable, and that matches. So, yeah, that sort of thing, all right? So, um, otherwise, you could do that as a shell style extended glob. Or just, in fact, as a regular glob. Do other people use these style extended globs? Do you want an explanation about those? Yeah. Okay. Basically, where you have round brackets in the middle of something and you have extended globs enabled, having a star or a plus or a question mark or an at sign indicates that it's a grouping thing and it means you can have slightly more complicated things like X or Y, for example. Well, uh, so okay. the difference being it's a repetition of two T's or an X and two T's. This is the sort of thing that's quite messy to do with a regular glob, right? So it can be quite handy. A lot of other commands, of course, you can simply give as many things. Whether it's an external command, you're going to feed it lots of arguments, so you can have separate globs to, do, to match separate things. But where it's something like a pattern match here, you need some way of actually condensing that to a single match, and that's quite useful. Any further questions? Single square bracket instead of double square bracket? Okay. Single square bracket is the classic, an alias for the classic test command. The double square bracket is almost equivalent, but it is a shell syntactic element. Whereas that is a shell built in, a, a, it's, and in fact, on most systems, you even have an external program called square bracket. Um, because the double square bracket is a syntactic element, 
it turns off the requirement for quoting. So, for example, you don't need to put quotes around variables ex expanded. And then you go back to using one of these single square brackets and you forget to put the quotes in and it all gets very awkward. Um, it also does shortcutting. So, um, this sort of thing, right? And to do that with a single square, square bracket, you actually have to write it as multiple commands. And it's faster. This is yes. Um, it's less error prone, it's faster. Um, it's not portable beyond bash. So if it's not usable, if you're not using bash, if you're looking at a classic shell or one of the other operating systems. Um, so that's the downside. Yes, this one. Typically, the instructions when you get given a script are along the lines of chmod a plus x script. And they say, that's it, you're done, now you can run script. Um, that's kind of a bit naive as advice. Not every system you're on puts bash in the same place. Um, every Linux system will have it in slash bin slash bash. But if you are porting to perhaps AIX or one of the others, you may find that it's in user bin or in opt GNU bin bash or somewhere like that, in which case you, have an op you, you, know, you can't simply rely on the kernel to find it because you actually have to edit the script. What's recommended by some people is to use something along these lines. This is something I don't actually hold with because it means that the interpreter for my script will depend on the user's current environment and if they have two different versions of Bash, perhaps they're testing old scripts so they've put something in their path that will find the old version of bash for some reason, then any program that has bash as its interpreter and uses that is going to break. <laughs> there are also implications for security. If some sysadmin installs a script into slash bin that has that in it, because it was supplied that way, and then you get a concatenation, right? You, where you then do sudo and that command. Fine, you go, sudo will sanitize things, but if you come in by, say, Apache, for example, it's not necessarily going to sanitize the environment. It's possible, difficult, but possible to, to compromise the security by relying on that. So I don't particularly recommend it for both of those reasons. So my proposal instead was, rather than tell people, just go chmod. Give them something like this instead. And essentially what this does is replaces the hash bang line at the top. Obviously, this one itself needs that if you're but it only has to be run the once, right? So you have install this. You know, install script and the name of the script you want installed. And it will go through and will clean, clean up a bit, bunch of things. It will notice if you, for example, if you've got a .pl or .py suffix on the file and go, well, actually, they probably want Perl or Python even if you haven't said so. So I will put this one up on the, the wiki a bit later. Um, the same kind of deal where we look at the command line arguments so you can make it behave like an ordinary command that takes arguments. At the bottom of the, so you have the loop, and at the bottom of the loop you have shift, which says throw away the argument, the first argument, because we've just dealt with it, right?
and down here. It tries to emulate the BSD install command plus patching the hashbang line to suit. Do you want, would people like me to go over this in detail or shall I just leave it up on the wiki for people to check later? Okay. Yep, question. I've seen in some um, bash scripts where variables are quoted, there's also the use of um, the squiggly brackets. Um, I haven't seen it that often, but I have seen it and I've wondered what its purpose was and whether or not I should be thinking about doing that too. You're considering the, you have, is that still set? It is. The difference between that and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. The only difference that makes is when I go there or there. For simple variables. Where you have compound variables, where you have substitutions, where you have any of those extra nice features, you need the curly brackets simply because otherwise there's no way to know. So if, uh, if you have array indexes, um, one of the little tricks, um, any simple variable is also an array with a single element. So that works. I want the first element of foo. Right? I want to add. Another question related to braces rather than uh, parentheses. The difference in execution is that one is inline and the other is a subshell, is that right? So I didn't quite catch the start. If, if statements are grouped between parentheses, yes, if you they're have, executed in a subshell, but in braces they're executed in that's line. That's true. That right? so, so you get yeah, CD layer. That, for example, so you get a complete copy of the environment. Uh, the curly brackets are just for grouping, so they have no effect on the scope. Um, there are other things, though. Uh, you can implicitly create a new scope. Uh, by having a pipe, any of the, any, pipelines always put all of the components in subshells implicitly, with the exception of the newest version of Bash, where you can request the last component to run in the foreground. Um, but that's not portable between different versions of Bash, so it's not something I'd recommend doing all the time, uh, especially when you can equivalently. do this. That has the same effect for connecting the pipeline together, except that that command there is then run. It runs in the foreground. So, and that again can be a block. This is, is just right. hence that second part has been run in a subshell, and I'm still back in my home directory. It's it's a common gotcha for people because especially where the second part is some complex loop, um, they will go some preprocess like said patch a file pipe that and then make a while loop 
and set some variables, and then at the end of the loop, go, oh, where'd the variables go? Well, the answer is the entire loop ran as a subshell, ran as a subshell implied by putting it in the pipeline. Another question? Hello. Uh, I want to know what's the uh, best practice in Bash to do the multiple thread? To do modules? Multiple thread, yeah. Like, for example, you need to SH to 100 servers, and you need to, intera to interact stuff with uh, all the servers. You cannot do it one by one, because it, it will take a long time. Absolutely. So you want to interact with, with the, all these servers, meanwhile, you know, parallel? Yes. Five years ago, when I first gave this talk, I had a Bash script that did that. It, that was one of those cases where I found it, I was encountering the limits of what I could do with Bash, and it's been rewritten as a Perl script. I'm not sure I could lay my hands on it today. But the basic idea of, yes, run a whole bunch of SSH commands in tandem so across a whole list of machines, uh, and dispatch commands, and then gather up the output. Um, that particularly it would put the output from each one into a separate file and then gather so that they didn't get all interspersed. It was quite, it's kind of useful, but it's not something I can demonstrate today. Um, the key problem um, was the bash wait command. You can wait for a particular process or you can wait for all processes. You cannot simply wait for the next one that finishes. Um, the POSIX wait system call upon which that's based, you can specify that you want just to get one process, the next process that finishes, subshell or some process which finishes. And that unfortunately is not something that Bash supports, nor indeed any version of shell. So hence I switched to Perl where I got direct access to the POSIX calls. Okay, questions? I could do a little on IP tables or some of those sorts of bash scripting of IP tables. This is something that's intended to run from system 5 in it D. So it has a bunch of things which, as far as the shell are concerned, are comments. But it basically says that it has these start and stop levels, as run levels. Um, it was originally maintained under subversion. Um, so there was this which subversion would patch whenever it was checked out. Um, subsequently, it's not. Um, but that part there will pick out the revision number from the middle of that, regardless of what's around it. This is a fairly short script, because all it does is this loop here, where it picks up the victory. since I looked at it. Each of those is a piece of the shell script. So effectively that loop then just reads and executes each of those in turn in the context of the current shell, not as subshells, not as separate processes. So the first simply does, are we passing in any command line arguments? So again, you see that loop structure that I did before. All right. Count the arguments, have a big fat case statement. There are various ways of handling command line arguments. I just ha 
patent on this pattern and find it works for me. Yep. Did I understand that you go through all those files? Yes. And they're all IP rules? They are all part of an IP rules construction suite. What if you want, you don't want one of them? Like, um, you want all the others, but those are open. That's it. Yeah, what if we want to do a quick modification? <laughs> uh, use this tool. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Um, I originally wrote it as a shell script as well, and then that really got out of hand, so I rewrote re re it as Perl. Um, doing the nice color thing just really wasn't working in Perl, uh, in Bash. So. <laughs> um, but the idea is that, that yeah, you, can, you can categorize your input channels indicate where you should be getting traffic from them and then what services you want to enable. Um, I can put it up somewhere, yeah. Uh, the, the, that's a question about the availability. I'll, I'll put a link to it off the, the uh, wiki. Um, but yeah, back to that. Um, essentially, yeah, there's lots and lots and lots. It goes on. So if anyone wants a big script, this is probably it. Um, to be honest, it's probably a little bit too big for the time we have. So, um, of note, in particular, it has this little function called IPT. And go back a few. Uh, it's in. in, in, in the problem. You get a big enough project and even the person who writes it can't quite keep track. So, right. uh, This is a firewall package that will do both IPv4 and v6 and give you the same set of rules, functionally equivalent rules on both. So that's, that's the idea there. Uh, if anyone wants an actual full description of this, come see me afterwards. Um, if you'd like a copy, um, put it on the wiki, but you probably want to come and see me anyway. <laughs> What's the uh, significance of the hash frame line on that? Essentially, it's a fake saying, don't try and run this as a standalone piece of code. Uh, so if you try and run it, it will fail. Uh, it's, it's a documentation line, really, saying, don't run me. <laughs> uh, but putting the word bash in there means that like syntax highlight in the editor still works because the, the editor will look for hash banks in a thing bash and go, oh, it's a bash script. Here, use this highlighting. So it, it kind of, it's a dual purpose thing. A, it says don't run it. B, it says please edit it as if it's a bash script because it is. Is that a convention or is that one of your own process? Um, that was my invention at the time. I have occasionally seen other people do something very similar. Um, Um, the third, the, the second line is well, just in case somebody decides they're going to try and run it anyway. Um, that's actually the, probably something. I could, this is a magic variable. Um, it's an array, as you may get, guess from having the subscript. And essentially, it's the stack context. So if you've got multiple shell functions, one calling another to another, or sourced files such as these, then you'll see the stack of line numbers and there are corresponding file name and function name arrays. So you can actually look through those and find a backtrace to the point where things occurred. Um, Could you show again how that's called? Okay. Uh, here we have a directory and pick up any file in that directory and then check that it doesn't have a tilde in its name because tilde is a common um, editor backup. Check that it is actually a file and not a symlink or a pipe or something crazy like that. Um, if we had debugging turned on then we want to actually print out what it is we're doing 
and then we want to read in that. If the return status of that piece of script is a failure, then we flag that for later. So passed, and that is passed there, so in that case we go OK or not, right? So you get something like that. And that's what you see as it happens. Those are being output by that in the loop. That's, this is this echo command here. This variable expansion here, does anyone want that explained? Five minutes? Thank you. Who understands that? No hands. Who doesn't understand it? Right. <laughs> uh, essentially, this is look for this variable, underscore, underscore echo underscore wrap. If it, is, if it has a value, then this will use the value. If it is unset or the value is empty, we get the word echo instead. All right. The point is that that would normally hand off to perhaps a, the, that could be the echo command or it could be something that just discards the output, so you get no output. Um, I think that was originally to support. Never mind. Um, point being is that these all read parts in. They, in turn, read other files. ones. Ah, okay. These files are added and removed by the this firewall copy, right? And the other files are read, read these ones in order to decide what to do. So you effectively you have bash running a, a little script which reads in fragments, which themselves constitute an interpreter for this data structure here, which then construct a firewall rule, which are then loaded. So there's a little bit of indirection and a bit of complexity to it. The point being that you can configure the firewall once and then it loads each time at boot and it can adapt to the interfaces that are available, it can adapt to the network connectivity that applies, it can have rules that are added or removed in tandem with packages that are installed, so you only turn on the rule that says admit port 25 when you've installed a mail package, for example. And that happens by putting a file in one of these directories. Anybody else comments on here? Okay. That's what the that's what the itchy thing in my beard was. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Just the last few minutes, or would you like to go early for lunch? No. One more question. Just over 20 years ago, I believe. Uh, 20, 25 years. Now, this is the question of when was Bash written, about 25 years ago. Uh, Chet Ramey has been maintaining it for 23 out of those 25 years. Um, as I said, it was one of the original GNU projects from the Free Software Foundation. So. Um, nobody much uses herd, but everybody uses GCC or Bash still. So. 
Um, this is a bit untechnical, untechnical question. Yep. Um, I'm constantly promoting Bash, and everyone else around me is saying that that's ridiculous. You should use newer tools. Do you reckon it's a lost cause? I'll just keep doing it myself and not worry about telling everyone else to use it. It's horses for courses, firstly, and secondly, there's an awful lot of inertia. Uh, you have all your init scripts are written as Bash fragments. You have a lot of script, a lot of programs that are in just in slash bin are actually shell scripts. So yeah, um, it's not so much you necessarily want to use it for a new program, but it, it's it's worth a shot. Because, and you need the familiarity with it anyway to, to be able to maintain your system adequately. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mr. Kelly. So.